Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Hope you enjoyed your tea break. Um, and basically, in this talk, I want to give a brief case study on the use of digital technologies and data management in the 100 Minerys excavation, uh, provide a brief demonstration of some of the software that we're using um, to meet our data requirements, and look forward to where we want to be by the end of the project and going onwards um, as a, a company. Um, in many ways, this talk is a follow-up to one given by our project officer, Chiz Harwood, at CAA UK two years ago now, on integrating excavation and analysis um, on urban excavation. Certainly worth a watch on YouTube if you're interested in the more general background on commercial excavations in London, the MOLAS single recording system, and the problems of integrating data generated in the excavation process with the post-excavation and archive phases. I'd like to say that things have moved on in leaps and bounds since uh, Chiz's talk, but the reality is a more evolutionary approach as the time, money, and technology allows. Major commercial excavations with their pressures on time and money and getting the site dug so the client can start building are not really suitable test cases for radical change. The 100 Minerys project is another step along the path for our LP archaeology as we look to develop an end-to-end -end system for managing our excavation data. Uh, the 100 Minerys project is a commercial excavation by LP Archaeology of a site just north of the Tower of London and adjacent to Tower Hill. It's just outside the medieval city wall and lies across the presumed line of the city ditch. Um, it was developed in Georgian times with the beautiful crescent and circus, of which only a small part remains, and uh, the basements you can see on the left there, which we've uh, excavated um, as part of our, our uh, excavation here. Um, in more recent times, was the site of the School of Navigation. Uh, besides our 12-strong field team, we're lucky enough to have on site both myself and Florence Lino looking after some of the digital aspects of the project. Flo has built our 100 Minerys website, runs our social media presence, and organises the 100 Symposium, a uh, forum for the diggers on the site to discuss the site and the wider meaning and put it into context of London archaeology as a whole. Um, I manage the digital data, develop our GIS, do surveying, and even get to dig on occasions, which is quite nice. Um, Off-site, we also have Mike Johnson and Steve Yu, uh, Stu Eve, working on the improvements of the ARC database system that we need, uh, particularly on the spatial and post-X aspects. Uh, for me personally, 100 Minerys is proving to be an interesting introduction to the world of archaeological data and applications. Recently switched careers from 20 working in uh, the commercial IT world and financial services for the last 23 years. And, you know, it's being thrown in the deep end on this project, trying to understand and develop a data workflow that I've only ever actually seen from a digger's perspective. Uh, so maybe some of the stuff that I'll be talking about will seem fairly obvious or old to people, but it's new stuff to me, so quite cool and exciting. Um, at LP, we're big believers in open source, open data and open access not just for the potential cost savings to a smaller unit such as ours, but indeed, okay, I'm sorry, this entire sentence has disappeared in the middle of my talk notes, um, and not just for the potential cost savings to a smaller unit such as ours. Indeed, providing timely and open access to the data and developing open source software may well be more expensive in the short term than not making the data available at all or purchasing a software package off the shelf. However, we believe that the wider benefits to the archaeological community and archaeological knowledge are worth the investment, as well as the long-term benefits that we can grow a community of users and contributors around the tools we develop. With 100 Minerys in the next week or so, we'll be making our ARC database open for anonymous access online under the Creative Commons Attribution Licence. We're consciously not putting a non-commercial use restriction on the data, as we want to have it to have the widest possible application, and we are unable to predict in what ways anyone will want to use the data, <coughs> if at all. Um, if another commercial unit wants to use it for other ex excavations, somebody wants to publish a paper before we've finished our final write-up, so be it. That's a good use of the data. We don't mind. Um, will the data at this level actually be useful to anyone or have any benefit? Again, we don't know. We can't predict. Perhaps a case of build it and they will come. But we can only hope that over time other units also reciprocate by opening out their closed data sets to the benefit of everyone. We prefer to use open source for our, as much as possible and we 
choose to develop, actively develop open source tools to meet our needs. Arc is our flagship product, and we've chosen QGIS for our GIS needs. Uh, for 100 Minutes Project, we need to develop new features in both of these and uh, to manage our data, with QGIS especially needing a lot of work to adapt its available tools. Our aim for the end of the project is nothing less than an end-to-end travel-to-archive data management system with a single context recording system that we can use on our future sites we, and that other people can use as well. We hope that by automating many of our current manual processes to improve our data quality, reduce our costs and generally provide um, improved efficiency across the entire process. Another key aim for the project is to improve our excavation process itself by feeding the digital data back to the field team as soon as possible by employing an on-site digital data person, i.e. me, to process the context sheets, plans and images as soon as they are checked by the project officer on site. Longer term, we hope that the tools we develop will be easy enough to use uh, by the normal field staff and their supervisors to manage the data themselves on sites where we're unable to have an on-site digital specialist. Whilst our primary interest is in improving our own processes and those of other ARC users, we are conscious that the tools we develop could have wider use for those who may not need to use ARC as their database or may not want to. We are aiming to keep these tools as generic as possible and applicable to a wider audience, and that includes connecting to other databases. So when it came to the uh, commercial archaeology through the community archaeology route, I'm particularly interested in ensuring that our GIS tools are of use to community groups on community excavations as I know they have a need for GIS tools, but really often don't know where to start. Right, getting to the actual digging. Um, the on-site workflow is probably closer to the traditional pen and paper than we may actually care to admit. And certainly the field team's process breaks no real new ground. Following the MOLAS single context recording system, we still use context sheets for recording features, permatrace for all our drawings or plans. Context sheets are scanned and stored for later uh, reference, and plans are scanned and digitised in our GIS, a process that we'll look at in more detail later. We have been discussing some ideas around how we could do both using tablets, and certainly the Dig Ventures team have done so with their context sheets in ARC. And we have a few ideas for how we might draw the plans on tablets, but that's quite a way off in the future, we feel. Uh, the main digital tool used by our field team is an iPad as a replacement to the site register. They connect via a mobile network to the 100 Minutes Arc to take out numbers as and when needed. Being web-based means that they can use any device they like, even their own phones, which happens on a fairly regular basis as we only have one iPad on site. Um, but this would be a disadvantage on other sites that have poor network connectivity or strict no devices rules, as quite happen, uh, commonly occurs in the commercial world. The alternative of developing an offline app that locks you into a single vendor's app ecosystem seen as less desirable and less in keeping with LP's open ethos. But it may be the only solution for offline scenarios. But there are options to make that more open. Photo management is also very much a manual affair. While it's possible to take photos using the iPad <coughs> and directly load them into ARC, for archive quality photos, you still need a separate digital camera. As photos are taken, they're registered in the ARC using the iPad. I then manually post-process all the photos, QA them, check they're the right way up, upload them into ARC, uh, which is a bit of a time waster, um, especially when you're tracking what photos haven't been registered, particularly if your, say, your project manager has been out taking 100 various general shots of the site and hasn't had time to re register any of them. It can be a little bit hard to get him to catch up. Um, reach the conclusion that we really need an app to do this for us and talk directly to the ARC. That's another item I've added to my very long to-do list. Um, such an app would also benefit us on the sites without a uh, digital data officer and that the field staff would easily be able to manage the photos themselves. Although if you're on an upload link over the mobile network, that could get a bit pricey. Um, we also shoot JPEG and RAW files, which means that our storage requirements are somewhat large. But fortunately, we have a very fat broadband pipe from the site office. Uh, so that's not so much a worry for us. Um, the archiving of those raw files is a bit of an issue. We need to think about long term. They're uh, very big and they're in a non-standard format and we need to think about that a bit more carefully. We do have a Wi-Fi enabled uh, camera which we can remotely control by the iPad or the iPhone uh, which uh, as you'll see in this selfie is really good for taking pole cam shots. One future possibility is that we could link this up 
to um, the ARC and register and upload the photos automatically. But I suspect the proprietary interface to the camera may cause a bit of an issue here, as is the bandwidth and battery life. The Wi-Fi on the camera runs out very quickly. Um, we have also dabbled a bit in photogrammetry, partly just to, to produce cool looking 3D models for the client uh, to put up on their website and look, you know, we've actually thought about maybe uh, joining together all the models in a reconstruction of the Georgian building and running zombies around in them, shooting them, maybe to get people's interest, but you know, that's just mostly a cool add-on. We do, however, well we have, however, tried to use them to produce orthographic <coughs> photos of uh, some of the structures and the floor surfaces to see if we can speed up the tracing process, digitizing process. Well, when it takes a week to produce a model that size, the, the time lag is just too great. Uh, it's not a practical means for producing ortho photos or digitizing. We'll have to stick to the more traditional methods. Um, our GIS digitizing workflow builds on the work of the previous LP projects at sites like Prescott Street, where the data standards and processes have evolved to support single context recording. Initially, these were done in ArcGIS, but more recently, QGIS has been chosen as our preferred um, application. Fortunately, QGIS does have a number of shortcomings in this digitizing functionality, and certainly doesn't have the convenient tools that ArcCAD or ArcGIS have developed over the years. Nor does it talk to the Arc. Um, so as part of the 100 Minerals project, we hope to address many of these shortcomings uh, by developing a set of tools and plugins, and even changes to QGIS itself. And that's where it's fairly convenient that I'm around, as I'm a, in my spare time, I'm an open source C++ hacker and one of the maintainers of the Qt toolkit that is used to build QGIS. So I'm in a somewhat unique position to be able to jump in and fix the things that we need doing. Now this is where the High Wire Act comes in. Um, let's see if we can have a quick look here. One of the things when I first started uh, doing this job was I was handed a pile of permatrace to start catching up on the digitizing backlog and soon found that the process is very laborious and manual and two particular things stuck out, stuck out to me as needing fixing very quickly. One was the georeferencing of all the plans. We can expect to have at least 3,000 plans to be digitised. Um, so scanning, georeferencing, digitising process, I'm really interested in speeding that up. And I found that with the georeferencer in QGIS is that it takes 40 clicks per plan to get it georeferenced. That's unsustainable to me. Um, the other problem we had was that if, you know, when you use the standard drawing tools, that when you go to, come on, okay, here we go, put in a line, and then you have to fill in all the details of the context, the source, the type, um, that is required for all the drawing here. That's too long and too prone to error. You forget to fill in fields, you fill in the wrong details, typing. It leads to QA problems, and we've had that, uh, for example, we've been trying to apply some of these tools to our um, Prescott Street site that we did a few years ago for the post -ex stage, and we found that some of the data is not very reliable. Um, so we want to have a process that pretty much anybody on site, any of the diggers, can come in when they've got downtime while the site is being you know, stripped back by the digger, or it's too wet, they can come in, they can do the digitizing themselves, data management, and move the process forward without it being terribly difficult for them, without needing to be GIS experts. So we've started working on a set of plugins um, to QGIS, mostly in the digitizing area. Um, we want to get it end to end and we'll eventually have a nice little first run wizard that sets up your grid and sets up your files and does all that sort of thing. At the moment that's a bit of a manual process. But there's a few things that we found that we're doing quite often. One is converting between our local grid and the uh, national grid. So we've got a nice little tool here that will um, tell you exactly where you are on the grid or do the conversions for you between the various points. Um, the main tool, as I said, is the drawing tool here. Uh, you start the process, though, in another little app that I've written, the scanning tool. Uh, basically, you need to scan the permatrace first. So I wrote this little tool that I can fill in the site code, type, number, and grid reference, and hit the scan button. It then saves all that metadata in the file name and in the um, EXIF data so that it can be referred to later on in the process by, the, by QGIS when it starts processing these files. This is something that, you know, on a down day, anybody can come in and get through this. Saves me the boredom of having to do it. Uh, from there, we can decide to load one of the raw files up. 
And in this case, let's pick one at random. And this is a slightly messy screen. Um, I'm still working on the interface for this, but this is a very simple georeferencer. Um, you'll see that we have zoomed into the three corners of the permatrace. What you need to do is click three times oops, to choose exactly where those three corners of the 5x5 grid is and click run and close. It's picked up the metadata from the, from the, uh, the file, goes, OK, I'm in grid 135245. It knows what the, the national grid for that is. It can call GDAL in the background to run that. Now, I've got one further improvement to that that I've, I haven't uh, actually integrated here yet, but using the Open Computer Vision Toolkit, we're detecting the shape of those crosses and automatically putting that red circle in, which means we have a fully automated georeferencing system that I can run in batch overnight with no intervention from people needed at all. So we can run and close that. This machine's slightly slow. Each ball. Never did this in the testing. <laughs> yeah. This is the risky thing of doing a live demonstration. You never quite know what's going to happen. Okay, <laughs> I think that is almost done. Gee, it's a little bit slow. You can see why I want to do this in batch, and that I don't want to be sitting there all day waiting for this on 3, 000, a pile of 300 scans that Chiz has just signed off and dumped on my desk. And if that doesn't come back in a moment, I'm just going to kill it. I think something is going crazy in the background. Anyway, so once you have your, uh, your, your permatrace loaded in, um, we'll skip straight past the bit of looking at it, we can start to draw and trace. And as you see here, we have a, a palette of various um, drawing tools that you can choose. It's going to have nice icons on it. Um, I'm not a graphic artist, so I haven't quite got around to that yet. You can do nice, you know, draw in the things in your plan here um, with as minimal effort of, as you like. It's taking, it'll take the metadata here that it would have pulled in automatically from the file that I loaded but didn't and add that to the tables in the background and add the code for what sort of feature it is. Um, so a few nice things. Hashes used to be the bane of my life because they took too many clicks. Now all it takes is two and I'm done. Levels, very similar sort of thing. Done like that. Um, so these are tools. We actually had a, an excellent use case for it two weeks ago when one of our staff members managed to injure her knee and field staff and she came in and spent three days doing the digitizing for me um, and basically after the first half hour of showing me how to do it she was able to digitize plans without any intervention from me um, other than doing a bit of QA at the end. So it is you know, conveniently useful for field staff to, to be able to use which is one of the big aims that I want to uh, want to meet on this. Um, so that's enough of looking at those. Yeah, you know, this may seem fairly common average normal things to anyone who's ever worked in the commercial unit and done digitizing, but we're pretty much starting this process from scratch, from zero, never having done these things before. So what do we want to do with future plans? How far do we need to go? Well, we obviously need to finish off our, our digitizing tools. We need more advanced digitizing modes, things like an automatic brick tool to draw neat little bricks, uh, automatic detection of the full extent of the context so that you can you know, load that automatically. Some automatic Q QA would be good to make sure that all the data actually makes sense, things snap to each other. We're wanting total station integration. Um, I want to be able to import the data that I've been surveying, have it automatically transferred into our shape files and coded up with the correct uh, type codes. We want to be able to spin off some of these parts to be generic standalone things like the georeferencer. We want to be able to start pulling live data from ARC. Uh, something that I didn't uh, demonstrate to you because we're a bit short on time was that I could actually click on the features, those contexts, and we go, well, it's supposed to go away and query ARC. At the moment, it's querying a CSV file because um, I don't quite trust the, I didn't trust the network connectivity here, uh, which is useful for the post -X phase when you get to, uh, you know, wanting to be able to analyse and turn things into subgroups and groups and there's some nice filtering tools I've written to be able to look at things at a group level and just show those particular groups. Um, Postex tools, uh, Chiz calls it the missing manual. We have the red book for um, how to dig in the single context recording system. 
No one has yet sat down and written the blue book, which tells you how to do the post -ex process. It's one of these things that's learned and passed on from master to apprentice. Uh, we would like to document that. We would like to then build tools that allow you to do that. One of the big questions we have is, do we put those tools in ARC? Do we, we put them in QGIS? Do we have them as some kind of standalone app? And that's something we need to discuss uh, with Mike and uh, some other people in LP as to where exactly these tools lie, where's the best place to implement these. Uh, we obviously want to document all this so that anybody who comes along later can actually know, figure out what we're doing. We want to cater for the non-ARC use cases, and very briefly, we want to cater for uh, the Harris Matrix. Now, Harris Matrix might be a little bit um, unfashionable, shall we say, for some people, maybe seen as slightly unnecessary, but it's very heavily used in single context recording. We can't live without it. But at the moment, we're stuck using an old DOS app called the Bond Software Package, and it doesn't run on Windows 8, and it's closed, and it's brilliant for typing in a lot of data very quickly um, and integrating all the plan matrices and simplifying them, but it's very closed. The alternatives are also closed um, and very hard to enter data in very quickly. So you end up actually doing it all by hand because it's faster. Um, we want to come up with a better solution than that. We would like to come up with some kind of standard file format um, and some kind of standard tool chain to process Harris matrices uh, so that we can load them directly into ARC and manipulate them that way. But that's where the obligatory XKCD cartoon comes in. Don't create a new file standard when you don't need one. Don't create new tools where ones can ex already exist that you can adapt. And in this case, um, Stefano Costa has, a couple of years ago, uh, prototyped uh, using the Grafters toolset and file format to do Harris matrices. Um, I've had a look at it. I'm not convinced that Graphers is the right format. Maybe GraphML or one of the other formats might be better, but it's something we want to actively work on to, to define a schema in one of the existing file standards and a set of tools to convert between things like the BOM package and other Harris matrix programs so that you can get your data out of there and feed it into your database. Um, so the conclusion, um, have we reached our stated aims? No. No, there's a way to go, quite a way to go. Um, it's a work in progress. We're making very good progress, and I think we're at the stage where we've actually got people digitising the data, and <coughs> it will be you know, starting to go online next week. The lag is the problem. Um, if you're wanting a reflexive process, you, know, you can't be waiting three months until you've actually finished an area and signed it all off before you can um, then see the digital data helps you um, as you're actually digging, because it's gone, it's passed. We need to improve our process there and get a more rapid turnaround. Hopefully now that the software is matured enough, we can actually do that um, and we'll uh, you know, start to see the results from that side of things. Um, and as for the, the you know, putting the software available for people, there's a bit of work before we want to do that, um, but we hope to achieve that in the next few weeks. Um, and then you know, we'll be open to start talking to people about alternative workflows, alternative databases, trying to support um, other common use cases. Um, and with that, I think I am finished. Thank you.